Hi, so my name is Johnny Webb, um, and I am one of three partners that run a, a, an independent production company in London, and we do documentary and television and what we call branded documentary. Um, I might tell you how I got here, because it's um, a funny story, and then I'll, I'll tell you why I think I've been asked to speak. I, um, I gave a, a talk at BAFTA in London last year, and at the end of the talk, um, Olek came up to me and said, uh, you know, we'd love to have you at our festival. It's quite new, and it's in Woodge. And um, what he didn't know was that I started a jazz club in Katowice in 1995, uh, which was a bit of an odd thing to do as a Brit in the 90s, but I did. And uh, we ran it for 10 years with my Polish partner, and I'd lost touch with him. And I was very sad about this because he was one of my best friends. And so I said to Olek, here's the deal. I'd love to come and talk, but if you find Wojtek for me, I promise you I'll come. And 48 hours later, there was Wojtek, uh, his Facebook, his mobile, and he's picking me up at five o'clock. So I haven't seen him in many years. So um, I'm very honored to be asked and be here, uh, and I'm especially happy to be back on Polish soil after many years. So um, I guess this is a story, really, of, uh, of um, trying to find new ways to bring audiences to content and really trying to uh, ha help people act upon the emotion that they feel when they respond to something that they're watching, whatever that medium might be. So just two minutes on Sundog, so you, you, you kind of understand the context for um, the film that I'm gonna tell you about. So when we started, we wanted to bust some myths and, and those myths go something like this, that um, many of the world's biggest problems are too difficult and complex and frankly overwhelming for people to understand. Or there's another one, um, documentaries particularly, which is what we do, are either serious critical hits that inform you or they're dumbed down popular entertainment with no takeaway. And another one which drives me especially mad is that people under 30, or even people under 40, certainly in, in Britain, but I think it's true worldwide, have stopped watching documentaries on television. And many people in the production world say that that's because people are apathetic and they don't want to know about the world around them. And that's blatantly untrue. What we haven't done as producers is innovate the form of documentary storytelling and provide it in a way that those people want to, want to see it and use it. And people like Vice, are really doing that brilliantly. So instead of that, instead of all those things, what we wanted to do was create something um, that brought important subjects to new audiences, that didn't preach to the converted, that tried to empower people with, with enough information and really entertain them with popular, accessible storytelling, but with really rigorous journalism to allow them to make some different choices. And the last thing really, which I guess is ultimately why I'm here, is that we, we call ourselves social producers. So we don't believe anymore that you can just be a production company and make gorgeous, informative, entertaining films. That actually, what you need to do is you need to, whatever, you, I mean, we have lots of phrases for it, make and market, that it's our responsibility to drive people and drive audiences and especially drive engagement to the films that we're making. And the thing that I think is most important in all of that is, is this need to act. If you're moved by something, if you're angry about something, if you're upset about something in a story, how can we as producers move you closer to the tools that enable you to really engage and immerse and go on your own journey through that story? So that's enough about us. So we decided that one of the things we wanted to do was um, create a series of films which took the world's biggest taboos and, 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 and bust them. And so the first one um, we did, uh, we launched right at the end of 2012 and it's called Breaking the Taboo Drugs. And it was really looking at the, um, the single biggest global policy failure, we think, of the last 50 years. And that is the war on drugs. And so over two years and um, nine countries. We interviewed Presidents Clinton and Carter. Um, Clinton was amazing. He talked about his brother being a cocaine junkie and how he understood the issue from the inside out. Um, 
we um, created this film. And like, I'm sure the audience is full of filmmakers and like most of you, I spent half my time filling out forms for funds and getting in 8,000 pounds here and 12,000 pounds there and we do a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And then we finished the film and we wanted a voice. And um, I'll tell you this because it fa was my favorite day one of the favorite days of my life, actually. So we decided that, let's aim high. Let's go for Morgan Freeman, because he's the voice of God. And, um, and so we emailed him, and uh, we said, Morgan, you know, we, we feel really passionate about this subject, and we think it's a story that really needs to be told. And within three hours, he emailed us back, and he said, at last, the voice of reason, I'm in. <laughs> and within a week, we were in Memphis recording his voice. It was quite incredible. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, why don't I just show you the trailer just so you can get a sense of the film and then I'll tell you what happened next. Jacob, thanks. Drug wars have been declared on local, regional and national levels. We must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one in the United States, the problem of dangerous drugs. Since 1971, $2.5 trillion have been spent on the war on drugs. So when we say no to drugs, it'll be clear that we mean absolutely none. Some think there won't be room for them in jail. We'll make room. But today, illegal narcotics are purer, cheaper, and more available than ever before. I think we totally misunderstand cocaine. If you can't control drug use in a maximum security prison, how could you control drugs in a free society? It's a business worth $320 billion worldwide. Whole nations have been brought to their knees by the war. In Mexico alone, 47,000 drug-related murders in the last six years. These problems are far more important than some futile goal of creating a drug-free society. Most politicians, they're afraid of being accused of being soft on drugs. But now, the ones who have had the guts to change their minds are ready to tell the truth. If all you do is try to find a police or military solution to the problem, a lot of people die and it doesn't solve the problem. You cannot make a war against drugs without making a war against people. It's time to break the taboo. Stop your war on drugs. It hasn't worked. So, you know, the, the, the statistic that still sticks in my head and still astonishes me, you may have heard it already, um, and I apologize to any Americans in the audience, but America has 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's incarcerated population. 25% of the prison population in the world are in America. It is a huge industry, and 80% of all of those people in prison are in there for some kind of drugs offense. So, uh, it, I mean, it was an astonishing sort of intellectual journey that we went on really. And so we did it what everybody does and you know we finished the film and we were all quite pleased with ourselves and and we started thinking like most people you know oh Toronto and Sundance and Venice and um, let's get all these uh, festivals together and start on our circuit of getting the film out and doing what everybody does. But there was a problem and the problem was that we were very very clear on actually what we wanted to do with the film. And firstly I had a sense that something was changing. And actually, you know, 18 months ago, if somebody had said to me, two states in America would fully legalize marijuana and a state in, in South America would fully legalize, we wouldn't have thought it possible. And boy, has it changed quickly. So there was a sense we had that our story was now, was right now, and that doesn't fit the long kind of circuitous festival season. So that was worrying us. But what we wanted to do more than anything was start a global conversation, get people talking about the issue. And specifically, what we wanted to do was change UN policy. So the policy in the UN currently prohibits any e experimentation at state level with anything other than outright prohibition. And our feeling was that wasn't allowing, particularly the states in South America, the chance to try we don't know what the answer is, and, and the film didn't actually say legalize or decriminalize, but it started to offer some alternatives. So we wanted people to actually get up 
and go and click on this petition so that we could deliver this petition. And guess what? We had investors, so we needed to make some money. And that was a difficult cocktail, but actually we were really clear that the most important thing was to get people talking. And then, so while that was happening, and it's incredible, isn't it, how just how fast this world of ours is moving, because it, to now when I talk about it, it feels like an age ago. But there were two things that happened that year that I think really uh, influenced me. One was Life in a Day, if you remember that. I'm sure you've all seen it, the Kevin MacDonald and Ridley Scott film. 80,000 people were invited to um, upload uh, YouTube videos of, of their bits of their life, and he pieced together that wonderful film that was then watched 35 million times. So that was the first time that for people like me who were predominantly long form, not so much now, but, but then was predominantly long form, were starting to get the confidence that we could do something different. Now that was in the face of all the advice that we got. So people that I love and respect very dearly said to us, if you're thinking of launching a feature documentary online, you're absolutely nuts, particularly if you go to YouTube because that's for cats on roller skates. It's not for serious documentary. You will not engage people, which um, I like a good challenge. So that really got me interested. And then something else happened. If I get you to think back two years, Coney, remember that? So uh, right or wrong, it was a sort of weird moment, wasn't it, where the, um, suddenly this thing went viral and the directors kind of went slightly off the rails. But I, so if, if you don't remember Coney, it was the, um, it was the uh, arrest Joseph Coney story. And I think, if I remember rightly, it was about 22, 23 minutes, something like that. That's now been viewed a billion times. And that did two things at the time. One is it really gave me confidence that if people, if that many people, I think at the time about 10 million people have viewed it, if that many people are going to watch a 23-minute film, I think I can get them to watch 40, 50, 60, 70 minutes. But what I loved about it more than anything was the directedness at the end of that film. So if you remember, and you got to the end, it said, go and do one of three things. Give us money, share the film, whatever it was at the time. And that really appealed to me, because actually he understood, or they understood as directors, that they captured an emotion, and then they were helping guide it out. It's like, now what are you going to do about it? And obviously people really went on to, to do a lot about it. Um, so, we took all of that and we thought, well, what could we do? How about we um, go to Google and we say, look, you've done life in a day, but you've never actually swapped a cinema window for YouTube to launch. Now, this was, on the one hand, I mean, it was a long shot. I mean, you know, dr down and dirty, South American drugs, um, you know, it's not exactly the kind of thing that a lot of big glossy corporations want anything to do with. It just so happened that there's a guy in the States called Jared Cohen, who is a, a senior guy at Google, who's obsessed with um, the, the, the shadow internet and some of these dark subjects. And actually, if any of you know anything about the shadow internet, a, a lot of drugs culture and drug dealing goes on. So, so we were lucky because he was kind of piqued by the subject. That said, commercially, it was a huge risk to talk about doing an online window first because actually we did a little bit of testing out in the market so we appointed a distributor like you always would to go and sell the TV window and actually what people were saying was well if you give it away why would anybody buy it? It's a good question I have an, an answer for that but, but that was the scepticism this kind of wall of scepticism that, um, that we faced and so what we tried to do was reconfigure the way that you distribute a film. We swapped cinema for YouTube. Google were absolutely unbelievable, and they came on board, and um, they, uh, they agreed to become a global partner. They gave us 40 territory, well, they call them territory spotlights. So the homepage of 40 countries, Poland included, were, had, uh, for a week, had uh, our trailer pushing people in, which obviously made a huge difference. Um, I think what I might do is show you what we did in that process on film and then I'll just cut back and tell you about what we learnt and what we're going to do next. So Jacob, can you just run the, the second film, please? I'm Richard Branson. I'm Kate Winslet. I am Gael Garcia Bernal. I'm Dizzy Rascal. I'm Bob Geldof. I'm Morgan Freeman. And I'm breaking the taboo. 
To launch the film, we decided to disrupt the traditional distribution model, swapping cinema for YouTube to offer the first truly global window of the film online, before a TV release in 2013. Sundog Pictures invited the audience to take immediate action, to share the film and join the debate. The campaign website, supported by a host of international opinion formers, invited the world to sign a global petition for change. We created a unique destination for private screenings, called Premiere in a Box. And celebrity support on Twitter extended the reach of debate still further to 30 million followers. The London and New York premieres, hosted by Google, featured live debate with the most informed speakers. Right now, the way we are conducting pot in my city is causing incredible death and destruction of lives. And precipitated a media storm on both sides of the Atlantic. There should be a royal commission to consider decriminalising some illegal drugs, according to a group of MPs. The MPs' report coincides with the launch of a global campaign urging politicians to break the taboo around drugs policy. A new documentary called Breaking the Taboo. President Clinton appears in the new documentary Breaking the Taboo. Okay, Jacob, that's great. The Thank you. Films. So, anyway, that gives you, that gives you an idea. So, so uh, actually, you know when, you, when, when something happens and then you, you do these kinds of talks, it makes it sound all beautifully strategized. The actual truth was I, we had no idea what we were doing. We were totally blindfolded and we were taking it day by day. But fortunately, we, we got a number of things right, but it didn't off throw up some challenges at the same time. So um, probably the most important thing in all of that for us was that 775,000 people signed a petition that we were then able to give to the UN and say, we think you should really look at this. And they're having a, a convention this year to debate that very thing. I'm not saying that's all down to us, but, um, but I, I, it probably helped. We had uh, 800,000 views, and if any of you are um, filmmakers out there that make feature docs, you could probably expect, if you have a smash hit in the UK and the US, you could probably expect 2,000, 200,000, maybe 250,000 people to buy a ticket at a cinema. So 800,000 views, uh, and a million and a half people came into the channel. Um, so it, it, was a, a, it was an absolutely phenomenal month. We managed to get onto the, um, the big news programme twice in the same week in the UK, and then we got onto pretty much every US news programme um, to talk about it in that week. So it was a huge spike. We then took the film down at the beginning of January last year, and, uh, which was interesting in itself. What we did behind it was build a YouTube channel, a website, um, we partnered with Avaaz. I mean, a lot of this for me, you know, one of the big lessons for me is it's all about collaboration. There's absolutely no way we could do 80% uh, of this ourselves. We didn't really know how to do it. It wasn't our skill. Our skill is in documentary storytelling, um, not in running petitions, not really in running campaigns, although I know a lot more about it than I did uh, before we started. So, um, so, the, so then we waited for, for the TV sales. And we started to build the argument, and I think this is a really, really important argument, that a lot of old media, and I used to be in old media for more years than I have been a producer, a lot of old media are terrified, run very scared of the internet, and scared of its potential to cannibalize audiences and cannibalize revenues. But actually, that isn't the problem that a lot of old media is facing. So in my world, my customers are broadcasters all over the world. Broadcasters are no longer commissioning single serious documentaries because they're incredibly hard to market in a world of diffuse attention. You know, most people say to me, come to me with a six-part series. Well, you can't tell a serious story in a six-part series. So my argument was this. Actually, your problem, traditional media, is that you can't afford the marketing and you're running scared of a diffuse and fragmented audience so you can't get the kind of quality programs that you want to get to people. What we will do with our model is that we will build a marketing model into it, inbuilt. So a million people watch this film in the whole world. It's tiny, it's a tiny drop in the ocean. But those are a million people that care deeply about the issue, that become the ambassadors, that talk to their friends about the film and build the awareness of the franchise so that when we sell it onto TV, um, 
people come in and watch. That's the theory. I can't stand here. I wish I could and give you lots of evidence for audience ratings around the world. It's sold in about 30 countries. Um, uh, and I haven't got as much audience data yet as I'd like because it's still doing the rounds, basically. But I, I, I absolutely, passionately believe that there is a model that integrates internet and paid media so that we can at last start to make some money, but we're using the internet for all the things that it's absolutely brilliant at. I suppose the other lessons for us, um, and it depends on you know, the kind of organisation you are, we are tiny, there's 10 of us, we're producers, so we deep dive into a subject for uh, six months or a year, or in this case two years, and then we move on. So we're currently making the next film, the next Breaking the Taboo. But of course, that's not what happens here. What happens here is you build communities of engaged people that have expectations. And um, that's, re that's been incredibly hard because people are emailing us all the time. You know, we've got an idea for policy and we want to talk to you and they're expecting us to continue to moderate and build and engage. So we still do some of that. Um, and I'll just... Um, you want to play the last? I mean, it's just I could have picked a, uh, any number. There's nothing special about this one. But just to just have a look at this. Hi there, it's Martin from Breaking the Taboo. Now, in January this year, Colorado became the first American state to allow a legal sale of recreational marijuana. The critics, and there were many, were adamant that the state was going to be inflicted by what people call reefer madness. These high school boys and girls are having a hop at the local soda fountain. Innocently, they dance. Innocent of a new and deadly menace lurking behind closed doors. Marijuana, the burning weed with its roots in hell. Interesting. Well, there are lots of think of a children type hysteria from US commentators. If we don't keep young people from smoking marijuana, there will be a brain drain inside of this state. When I'm at work, I don't want my babysitter high on pot. Hmm. All right? Does anybody? Do you want your children, do you want your parents, your sister, your brother to be taken care of or driven around by somebody on pot because it's okay in Colorado? You know what? Colorado gets what they ask for. Well, it's been six months since the stores opened, and here's what we've discovered. Retailers have made $70 million. This is almost $11 million in okay, tax revenue great. already. $40 million of tax revenue. Thank you. So, um, so you get the idea, but actually, we hadn't foreseen that when we launched the film online and we built the community. We didn't realize that we were going to need to service this kind of monster, it's not a monster, but you know, it's this machine, this hungry machine that kind of eats content. Um, and so uh, the brilliant Martin, who we pay for from our branded work, but whose passion is this subject, is there to continue to build that, um, that audience. Um, what else? I, I, I mean, I, I, think, I think the gap is definitely closing between free and pay. And I think the more experimental people in pay are beginning to understand that these two worlds can work together and work, that we need to find different ways of weaving them together. So we are, um, we are already in production on the second Breaking the Taboo. So we've shot in uh, the US and Africa already. And you know, in a sense, you know, honestly, the, we were way down the production of this film before we really started to think about what the hell we were going to do in terms of cinema or not and, and YouTube. And what, I, what, what I'm determined to do this next time around is take all of those lessons and say, right, how do we do it differently this time, right from the beginning? So actually, the thing that we're going to do I suppose more importantly, I think, than anything in the next six months is we're going to launch a YouTube channel quietly that sits behind the new film and the subject matter. Notice I'm being quite cagey about it. I apologize for that. But, um, and um, we're going to, we will have somebody like Martin who then starts to build that community of people. And our target is to have 50,000 people in a community that care deeply about the subject matter of the next film, who are there as our friends and partners to help us launch the film. And that, it opens up all kinds of interesting things about um, platforms that we've heard about this morning. So if you take Kickstarter, for example, we do need some more funding. So we may well 
uh, asked Kickstarter to help us post-produce the film. But actually, in a funny way, don't get me wrong, the money's very important and it needs to come from somewhere to finish it off. But in a funny way, actually, I think Kickstarter is a, it, as important to build engagement and to pre-build fandom into your gorgeous projects as it is about raising money. Because that act of actually taking money out of your pocket and giving it to somebody is a big act of giving. And that nothing is engaging. Nothing shows commitment and engagement like that. And I think once people have given, even if they've only given a pound or a euro or a zloty or a dollar, whatever it is, they're in. They're really in. And so actually, we will probably use Kickstarter as much for that this time round um, as, uh, as, uh, as, as fundraising. Um, and I think I've told you the story, really. I hope that's interesting. I feel a slight Luddite because um, we know we're, we're not transmedia producers yet. We have ambitions to be. Um, and this is very much a kind of traditional story, but taking one step into a new world and, and starting to take some risks. But we've learned a lot, and I think the second film will be very different. Um, thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audience? Maybe? No. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay, just a second. <clears throat> Recently, I, I had not the secret information, but I think there is uh, everywhere that YouTube from the last year, they will start uh, uh, sort of pro profile payment. YouTube will be pay will be a paid service. Right. It is, it is right. So, but I, I am I'm a little bit puzzled because I would like to understand if, uh, if I pay YouTube $20, $20 per month, this money will arrive in the pocket of what I see or not? Well, <laughs> it'll be, I suppose, I suppose the closest cue would be to look at Spotify, wouldn't it really? Exactly. And I think I don't know enough about it to give you a, a, a learned answer, but from everything I've read from the music artists, yeah. everybody feels pretty shortchanged hmm. from the from, from the amount of revenues. So, in the sense that your uh, your uh, your strategy to create a fandom will be absolutely a winning point. Yeah. Because if your fandom will see your features, yeah, the money of uh, this very little money because they are uh, they are starting to think to to make a, um, to make pay the people to see music and after that even for uh, for uh, for feature documentaries this is i think there's a very good idea but very good idea yeah uh, well and and also you know uh, alongside Net youtube in the last two years you've got amazon you've got netflix so we've pitched the next film to netflix now that comes with all kinds of other issues for us and our independence and and our ability to control our rights and all those things. But in a sense, that's a nice problem to have. Because if, if, if we're experiencing a window of, of crisis where, where, the, where the old media and, their, and the funding of, of our ideas is kind of breaking up, uh, I think in the last, I mean, I feel really optimistic about it. I can see lots of people that you wouldn't have expected to be funding the kind of content that people in this room make suddenly starting to come through. There's, you know, there's lots of commercial issues that come with that, but, but let's take it step by step people are starting to come back to the table that we wouldn't have spoken to previously with money. And I think that's interesting. Great, thank you. Okay, there is one more question, right? Yeah. Uh, did you have uh, any income from the project? I mean, uh, altogether, um, the fundings you raised, and uh, you probably invested a lot too, but, um, it work out in in terms of money and income yeah we did um so we uh we the total budget in the end was probably about uh three hundred thousand pounds and we made the princely sum of four thousand pounds from youtube <laughs> from the advertising but we i think in the end we've probably made about um a hundred thousand from distribution, so it, 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 there's no way it, it, it came close to breaking even. Um, so yeah, so it, you know it wasn't a commercial disaster, but uh, for some of our investors whose main issue was getting the money back, it was a disappointment. For, for others, you know, we hit. We, they thought it was a massive success. Okay. Any other questions? 
Thank you very much.